Hello and welcome to part four of the comments response from the chief uh, response from the Chiefs of Staff series. This should be fun. Henning von Holzendorf. Cool. So let's see what other questions. Ooh, I haven't looked at these since it uh, posted it. But other than the last three, I haven't looked at yet for fear of what did I uh, let out by putting them on. Ooh. Before I get into that, though, I'm going to quickly advertise. I have a Spreadshirt store, I have a Discord, I have a Patreon, you can subscribe to channels, all those, I should probably be putting that out. But also, I would add that what I have, which is quite cool at the moment, I have a little competition going for my aunt. Thanks to the Spreadshirt store, I have two, well, I have till December the 31st to reach 13,000 subscribers. If I do that, then my aunt and uncle will take pictures wearing Blackburn, Blackburn, which you can find on the Spreadshirt Shore, face masks, and which and I will get family little bragging rights for roughly a year. So, please. This got me the, actually, a bet with her is what actually launched me to about a, thousand, a little over 1,000 subscribers. So, it might happen again. And literally, she'll then claim credit, but, you know. Anyway, Henning von Holzendorf. Uh, George Crabbe, stay with Paul. It's going to be HMS Warspike. We don't know what the best drone lot is going to be yet. Uh, Frank Spano, Dr. C, can the Risk Fleet idea apply to craft, aircraft and army or missiles? Um, the Shrike 616, I would argue that China is building a risk on all armed forces right now. Uh, to an extent, it can be. It can be. The idea you can make the cost of conflict so big that you think that, that, that whoever. Even if they win, they're going to lose. Or that that other people will go and attack them. Seemingly, I've learned something new about German pronunciation. I apologise right now. Henning von Holzendorf. I think I've got about right. Turpitz. I think I've got about right, but I, I'm never quite sure. As I said, I've had to give up, give up languages at thirteen, so it's all been learnt by fr talking to friends and family. And the Shrike 616. Fantastic, really. Your texts make puzzle pieces for the my books. Answering questions that have lingered in my mind for ages. Thank you. Just student, read England versus Britain. The English, Scots, and Welsh thing it matters. The rest of the world doesn't really think it makes a difference. We think it matters. And that's the point. <clears throat> Plus, to be honest, British covers a lot of other words in a lot of other things, like the Isle of Man, the Channel Islands, Falklanders, and and lots of other groups which come under the Royal Navy in British. Knight six eight three one. I wanted to clarify. What is your viewpoint that would uh, viewpoint would be the most likely option to replace the ferry gannet in AWACS and cod rolls, assuming the Royal Navy got its fleet carrier plan of two CVA ones and two rebuilt audacious class CVs? I think they probably have ended up with three CVA ones and no audacious class, but uh, we'll leave that to one side. Um, my answer is probably the Hawkeye. They had already gone American with the Phantom Star Fighter. They and that was already linking up with the Hawkeye and the two C. And they might well continue with pairing for AWACS and then concentrate the British money on the Buccaneer and Sea King and their successors, which is what I think they probably would have done. Um Knight six hundred three one. Uh, well that would make sense. And CVA one's catabolt could launch it, although I can't see the audacious class carrier launching or using a Hawkeye due to their size and weight. They could have been upgraded if they'd been used, but as I said, I think the susp my suspicion is they'd end up with three CVA ones. They'd have slowly retired. Basically, the fairy, the gannets would have stayed in service until the audacious has went. Strangely, the Phantom Buccaneer were too heavy for CVA one's catapult, which had a weight limit of 55,000 pounds. That would have probably had to be changed, but it could have been. So I guess uh, if you consider they had the audacious could take it, they could have been, they, worst comes worst, they'd have transferred the um, catapult. So I guess the C2A Greyhound takes over the cod roll as some P138B gets canned as it did seem. It would be, it, the thing is that wasn't even flying and I don't think there would have been the money to develop a whole new line of aircraft again. Um, have you heard of all the uh, heard of at all the proposed Hawker Sidley Type Seven Six Eight? Yes, I have. It's in my specifications book. I'm, I'm not sure that would have been pushed on too much. Jack Wright, I just clicked on this video and saw, uh, saw that I first read as Hosenoff. I thought, no, not another Hosenoff, like like the wonderfully poor Austrian general Conrad von Hosenoff. Thanks to the Great War Channel, the name got drummed in my head. Then I looked more closely and saw its different spelling. Thankfully, uh, Bella Can, sir, give me your Instagram link. Um, it's 
literally Dr. Alex Clark. <laughs> That's my Instagram name. I'm quite able to be found. It's not that there's not, not much that goes on there at the moment yet. It's usually when I'm traveling I put stuff on it. And Q Fisher again with continuing his attempts to get uh, Dr. Clark for uh, talking for all Dreadnought Day. I might well have made you uh, made you very happy for that day. I might have a guest. Uh, Rick, Rick Vassala, the Risk Fleet theory of German, uh, Germany having the British fleet being torn apart and the Empire being no more reminds me of the French and Spanish plans for the defeat of the British, as stated in one of the videos, where at the end, after defeating the British fleet, they sell up tens and dictate terms of surrender. Basically, the idea is for the Risk Fleet, as I've said several times, is that they were building a fleet which would be so big that the British, even though they would probably build have a bigger fleet and beat them, they would have lost so much that then the French and the Russians and the British would be at an exposure which the French, Russians, or Americans could gang up and take them out. There are three problems with this. One, A, how much would the British build in response to you? B, You're betting that on the French, Russians, and Americans probably cooperating? That's not going to be quick. And C, if there's any delay in them deciding to involve, then the British might rebuild. They might build more. They might shore their position up in other ways. Are you expecting Empire to rebel if they lose their fleet? If they have fleet sufficient damage? Well, as long as they still have the fleet left. Uh, they can still get around the Empire, and the fleet's not what gets troops around the Empire. The supplies around the Empire, and remember, they have troops in most of those places, and a monopoly on force. It's not going to be a great scenario. It's not something Britain wants to happen. So don't get me wrong on that one. But it's not the total loss that Tirpitz often seems to think it would have be, been, and projected would have be. been. Now, Yonai. Oh, I love this. Uh, this is possibly my favorite admiral of this series. And it's a running contest between him and... Fushimi Hiroyoso, Hiroyoso, uh, who were uh, the most important to the Japanese development of their fleet and doctrine in the interwar period. Honestly, they are the two minds of the Japanese Navy. I can make a very good, strong case of that. Uh, John Doon, dog really want to join in. Yes, the fluffy research assistant really often does want to join in. <laughs> yeah. Um, X. Thank you. Uh, Dark Dream. We set up for money stream. Are you sure it isn't all just going on Iron Bro and books? Here's an explanation. Whilst there was a pandemic, a pandemic, maybe. Now it's also going towards petrol, and um, maybe eventually hotel bills and the ferry of the flights. Uh, we can always dream it. Again, that one again. Tasha Vershal. Hello. I haven't had you seen a comment of you in a while. Very good video indeed. Thank you very much. And Jack Ray. Thank you for uh, this series. Thank you. I, I think one of the reasons why I got less comments on this one is because Yonai is possibly the least well-known of all the Japanese admirals. And again, I'm going to refer to my source about him because he is someone who I think should be known more. And... And a source up. Personal facts. Kind, gentle, and somewhat reserved. Spoken read Russian. Could drink copious quantities of alcohol without noticeable effect. No personal ambition. Never compromised his principles. Usually right on policy matters. A moderate in military matters. Said by his contemporaries to be one of the three greatest admirals Japan had produced. 
well respected both nationally and internationally. Other facts one. Initially opposed to the building of Yamato-class super battleships, but was forced to accept them. Two. Opposed army plans to conquer China after the Marco Polo Bridge incident. Publicly sacked T. Mutsanami for sinking the American gunboat USS Penne near Nanking, China. Three. Declared a non-involvement policy in the European war, but would not issue a public declaration of neutrality. Reached an agreement with European Allied powers by refusing passage of returning German men of military age in Japanese ships. In June 1945, he expressed a desire to resign as Navy Minister because of his dissatisfaction with the cabinet movement towards peace, but was persuaded to stay on it on to prevent the automatic fall of the government. Enforced general naval compliance with the Allied surrender document requirements, even though opposed by senior naval officers such as Tionichi and Sumeya Toera, and younger officers who wanted to fight on. Navy ministry and his post abolished by American occupation forces in October 1945. Gave evidence to the International Tribunal for the Far East War Crimes Trial, Tokyo, 1948, 6 to 8, and died aged 68, 1948. In 1941, he predicted that the, he advised the Emperor that the war between Germany and Britain would be protracted and that America must become involved with Germany losing and Japan, if she also declared war, left fighting America alone. Opposed war at conference with seven other Jushin and the Emperor, where he also told General Tojo that he would not give an opinion as to the need for war. Turned down Tojo several points when he was uh, when uh, asked by Tojo to rejoin the cabinet as Navy Chief Staff Navy Minister to save it. Mitsumasa, you and I. There is stuff he does which possibly will make it in his early career not acceptable. But honestly, if any admiral in the Japanese Navy's history deserves, um, other than examples of the Russo Japanese War and certain things, deserves a ship named after him, it would be Mitsumasa Yonai. He is a true character and someone I wish there was more book, English language text about him and more furry research English language text around, about him than I could go and read because he is a really interesting character. Right then, Ernesto Bergasli. Ah. Now, in this one, I have to apologize because there's lots of comments about the audio quality, and I'm not sure what happened to the audio quality in this one, but I apologize, okay? It, I don't know. Sometimes when this reloads, it seems to get various things wrong. Um, Sean V. At least the, uh, these don't look like hotel commissioners. Seriously, though, Doctor, I have thoroughly enjoyed this series of talks. I know history is turning out to be far more interesting and less dry, no pun sarcasm intended, than I expected. I wish I had taken time to delve into the subject years ago. I appreciate the effort to see you put in this aspect of work. I love it. And I love naval history going out. And I think this is there are people like that, like Yonai, Berzagbi, um, who don't get talked about enough. They don't get studied enough. They don't get learnt about enough. Because here is the thing. How is it 
we talk about uh, we've talked about various systems and people have point out with Donets, you know, he could have been, he could have been killed. Yonai. He is standing up to Tojo in front of the Emperor. He is there are several assassination attempts that seem to take place again. They all fail. He is man if you ever want an exa another example, I said I pointed out Canaris at points as speaking truth to power. It's often not nice people who do that. It's often they have to be quite tough to be in a position to speak truth to bad, nasty people. Yanai does it. He does it very well. And I have looked into this one. Uh, it gets kind of interesting because there were numerous comments about whether or not Yanai actually was given a pen. Or whether the pen was a ink drawing, uh, 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 the special sort of thing, rather than that, because it goes with the inkwell. I have looked into that as much as I can, and honestly, I think that needs more research on you and I. So, yeah. Douglas Q, a nice ACDC with a shirt. What is your favorite um, song? Back in Black is my um, ringtone. Andrew Bent, I'm curious about the Admirals of the Royal Romanian Navy. How good were they at getting what they could, and could they have gotten what they needed to make the Black Sea safer for the Red Navy? Uh, from from the uh, from the Red Navy, and if that did happen, how would it affect the course of the war in the East? They were quite good. No, they probably couldn't. And if they had managed to keep the Red Navy out of the Black Sea, then or at least kept the Black, Red uh, the Soviet Navy on the back foot in the Red Sea, then World War Two could have been interesting because the Germans could have theoretically got around some of the German blockheads by using amphibious warfare. If the Germans had been able to relied on their allies, that's the trouble. It's one of those things of it's a theoretically possibility, but actually to get supplies through. One of the interesting things is really considering their friendship with the Ottomans, etc. Um, with I mean Turkey by that point, if they at any point managed to pass, if the Germans had supported the Italian fleet more. And the, and the Italians had managed to get some of their fleet through to go join up with the Romanian Navy and the German units in the Black Sea. That could have been a real problem for the uh, Russians. It never happened, though. I hope these videos have been better audio quality-wise. I do apologize for that. I have played around with the settings, and hopefully they are better. Hopefully. I played around with the settings during a live, and I hope that made them better. I really do. So, <sighs> thank you very much. Uh, there weren't any really questions about Ernesto, which is sad in a way. He does deserve some questions, but I can understand him not getting questions. I can understand him not getting the questions, perhaps, as said. But it's a shame. So, that finishes the series of Chief of Staff of the Axis Navies um, from World War II. And I'm probably going to look at various other points. I'm going to look at a do. Some of the stuff on Model 1, although currently, as I've done, Holzendorf, that does co rather cover the Germans for World War 1. And I will look at others at certain points. I am going to try and keep up this idea of looking at some of the back doors of history. Because we talk about the fleet commanders quite a lot, because we get interested in the battles and all those things. And you don't look at what the Chiefs of Staff do. And so we're going to get into this. And thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed the videos. I hope you... Like the videos. What do we have coming up next? Is probably the next question. Well, what we have coming up next? We have. Well, that should have happened on Sunday. But on Thursday, we have interwar uh, naval aircraft development, especially what could have been. 
And then on October the 2nd, we have HMS Dreadnought Day. That's going to be fun. Right. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you like the videos and um, take care.